This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by the Magic Monday podcast. Magic Monday is a new podcast about all the ways we experience and use the magic of the universe in our everyday lives. Give it a listen to learn about energy healing, tap into the energy of the week, and get fresh magical ideas throughout the wheel of the year. Find Magic Monday at magicmondaypodcast.com and wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Cat Coven. Cat Coven is an online shop for weirdos, witches, and warriors created by Brooklyn-based artist Kirsty Farrett. The shop is a way for Kirsty to share her magical artwork on products ranging from apparel, catnip toys, pillows, mugs, patches, and other accessories. Her illustrations are inspired by her love of art history, witchcraft, feminism, and of course, cats. Nearly all the screen printed items are printed by Kirsty in small batches to ensure quality. Visit the shop at catcoven.com or on Instagram at cat underscore coven. And Witch Wave listeners get 15% off their entire Cat Coven order by using offer code WITCHWAVE15. So pop on over to catcoven.com and use code WITCHWAVE15 for 15% off today. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Welcome to the Witch Wave. I hope you are safe and well, although if you aren't, I completely understand. And in that case, I hope you are able to find a sense of peace or at least centeredness as swiftly as possible. Our last episode touched on ways to work with the shadow. But this episode is all about basking in radiant rainbow-colored light. And that's because my guest is Edgar Fabian Frias, an artist and witch, or brujekis, as they describe themselves. And our conversation made me think about the ways in which pleasure and delight and play are still so devalued in contemporary culture. And yet so often it is beauty and color and laughter that can allow for us to much more easily digest powerful messages. I made the argument in my book that Mary Poppins is a witch, and I bet many of you can remember the original film's song that goes, A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And one of the reasons I love RuPaul so much is because if you're paying attention, you'll see that beneath the glamour and innuendo and cheekiness of his career and character, you'll find all of this deep wisdom about what it means to be a spiritual being wearing human drag. It's such an important important and enlightened message. And yet, because we're having fun while we're receiving it, it doesn't feel like homework or being lectured to from some holier than thou being. 
And so we can receive it and integrate it and be laughing our asses off all the while. Sometimes I'm asked about writers that have influenced my witchcraft. And if you're curious, you'll find some of those books listed on the Witch Wave FAQ at witchwavepodcast.com. But it's occurred to me that someone I don't mention nearly enough is the fiction writer Tom Robbins. But I've read pretty much everything he's written over the years. And even though I can now see through my adult perspective that his own perspective is very much of an older generation in a lot of ways and is riddled with its own imperfect politics, sexual or otherwise, I still count him as one of my very favorite writers because he writes about spirituality with this madcap exuberant vibrancy that I just find absolutely irresistible. And he actually addresses the issue of style in his first novel called Another Roadside Attraction. In it, his protagonist, a clairvoyant named Amanda, says the following, quote, the most important thing in life is style. That is the style of one's existence. The characteristic mode of one's actions is basically ultimately what matters. For if man defines himself by doing, then style is doubly definitive because style describes the doing. And Amanda later goes on to say, it is content or rather consciousness of content that fills the void. But the mere presence of content is not enough. It is style that gives content the capacity to absorb us, to move us. It is style that makes us care. Unquote. Now, of course, Substance matters immensely, and style without substance is just vapid and superficial. But style is what makes something feel personally engaging. I grew up reading lots of Jung and Joseph Campbell, and it was thinkers like them who taught me that universal experiences are cloaked in culture. And I think that this is what Madame Blavatsky, with all of her complicated issues, was trying to get at in the 19th century with Theosophy, the spiritual system she developed, whose motto is, there is no religion higher than truth. In other words, if we peel back the veils of context and culture and style, Underneath all of those trappings is this need to survive and connect and love. And yet style is the means by which we pursue and express those things. Different veils attract different people. Think of how many love songs there are in every genre Or how many ways there are to pray to a divine spirit or request assistance or express awe. And yet, we as individuals gravitate toward specific styles of song or spiritual actions that resonate with us. Now, some of this, of course, is learned or socialized. But if we're lucky, we grow up to have the freedom to follow the magnetic pull of that which calls to us. This is one of the reasons why I try not to be a prescriptive witch. When it comes to witchcraft, which is the style of spirituality that I gravitate towards, that makes me come alive and get the most excited... 
This is why I encourage people to trust their instincts, follow their own path, and add their own flair to whatever magic they are making. Doing witchcraft in whatever style resonates with you and makes you the most excited or touches your heart in the most tender places is the correct style for you. And this is why I so admire the work of my guest today, Edgar Fabian Frias, who works their own magic with such a vivid sense of style. Their artwork and witchcraft practices are hyper-colored and big-hearted and doesn't take itself too seriously. And yet, in between the neon and emoji explosions is a well of wisdom, consideration, and hard-won liberation. We'll be speaking about how Edgar came to develop this rainbow-drenched approach to creativity and conjuring. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Witches! Caitlin writes, I'm a green witch living just outside Seattle. I just listened to your most recent episode with Lisa Marie Bazile, who touched on so many things that I am going through right now, as your podcast often does. I wanted to reach out and respond to one part in particular. I am lucky enough to live in a house with a yard and an intense love of gardening. My husband, who normally works too much, is home with me every day. My daughter was having intense behavioral problems at school, and now she's removed from the classroom setting that wasn't serving her. From day one of the quarantine, we've been experiencing more positives than negatives, knock on wood. I'm making sure I take in and appreciate every blessing during this time, but I also feel guilty. I feel I need to pay it forward, but I'm not sure how. I've been asking myself this question over and over. Is there something to be said for just taking this time to be happy? Does my shift into quiet serenity somehow help calm the collective chaos? Or am I just sitting in an ivory tower while others suffer? Maybe it's just my turn to wait and heal, so that when it's my turn to act, I will be strong enough. But of course, I can't shake the feelings that there's more I could be doing now. The world is filled with conflicting energies right now, and I think we're all struggling to know what to do with it, practically, emotionally, and magically speaking. So I would love to know your thoughts and feelings. Hi, Caitlin. Thank you so much for this question. It's interesting because I was speaking on the last episode of some of my shadowy feelings around being a New Yorker and how in some ways it's a very specific experience which brings out specific pain right now for those of us who live here. But I also acknowledged and want to emphasize again here that any grief or discomfort I'm feeling is very relative and that I have so many blessings and privileges that many, many, many people don't have right now. And I'm well aware of it. My husband and I are both able to keep working and do that from home, which so many people are not able to do either because they are essential workers or because they have lost work. We're both healthy, and though we've had some devastating losses in our community, our immediate family members have been healthy and safe so far. We don't have children, and so we're not struggling with balancing schooling and our jobs. And yet all of that doesn't negate the heartbreak and fear and confinement that we're also feeling. All of these things can be true at once. And I think we all need to keep our compassion intact for each other, even when, or especially when, our circumstances 
feel vastly different at times from people we either know or don't know. When I was talking about my shadow feelings that come up when I'm speaking with people who have access to private outdoor space or who live in places where the devastation of this disease isn't visible right outside their window, those were feelings that I'm not proud of, but that I have also been working through. And I wouldn't ordinarily have shared them so openly, but I did have an expert on shadow work as my guest, and so it felt relevant at the time. But I certainly was not bringing it up to make anyone feel guilty or judged for having a different or more comfortable experience than mine. So thank you for letting me clarify. And let me say again that if you are not suffering right now, or if you are even enjoying aspects of this quarantine, that is great. I don't want anybody to suffer. And I think it is so important to count our blessings and focus on the positive. And there are absolutely aspects about this time that I'm able to appreciate or take pleasure into. So I think that's the first thing to keep in mind, which you're already doing, to be grateful for the good things, but also to be sensitive to those who might not have what you do. If you are thriving right now, fabulous. If you are healing from, it sounds like, some difficult circumstances between your husband working too hard, as you say, or your child really struggling in school, and right now those things feel like you're experiencing some relief around them, that is fantastic. I want there to be silver linings that are coming out of this very, very challenging time. But then I would say, maybe don't go on and on about how much fun you're having to others who are really struggling right now. I'm not saying you're doing that, but for those listening, it's just something to keep in mind, to know your audience and to be sensitive to what other people might be going through. That doesn't mean you have to lie and tell them that you are suffering when you are not, but just to be sensitive and hold space for their suffering too. But to answer your question specifically, I do actually think that we all have an obligation to give what we are able to right now when we are able to. So if right now you've just really needed to recharge your batteries and take care of yourselves and heal and strengthen, I understand that. But yes, when you are ready, and it sounds like you're getting there if you are even thinking about these things or asking these questions, there are so many ways that you can help. Can you donate money to a food bank or to a nonprofit like Meals on Wheels, which brings meals to seniors? Can you do a bit of virtual babysitting for your friends or family members who also have kids? Can you go grocery shopping for a neighbor or drop off herbs or flowers or food from your garden or your kitchen for people who might need it? Can you make masks for your local hospital? Can you call a friend who might be lonely or scared and just listen to them and love them? Maybe you can phone bank for a candidate that you believe in or send that candidate money because we absolutely need political change come November because make no mistake about it, politics has definitely gotten us into the mess that we're in on a lot of different levels. And I don't need to go on a tirade about that, but it is something that I do believe with every fiber of my being. Now, let me be clear, you do not have to do all of these things or deplete your own reserves out of a sense of self-flagellation for all the good things that you have. Just pick one for starters. And when you feel called to do it, give it a whirl. And then after you do it, maybe you'll want to do a little something else and a little something else. Just take it day by day. There is absolutely nothing wrong with finding joy right now. In fact, I think it is absolutely essential. But I also believe that the biggest, brightest magic we can make 
is being generous with the light we have so that others can be lit up too. So shine on, Caitlin, and thank you again. Now on to my guest. Edgar Fabian Frias is a non-binary, queer, indigenous, and Latinx, multidisciplinary artist, curator, educator, and psychotherapist. They work in a variety of media, including photography, video art, installation, printed textile, GIFs, performance, and other emergent genres, and they incorporate magical practice into their artwork and vice versa. They also conduct ceremonial, divinatory, and healing services through their offering, which they call Our Sacred Web. For 2019 and 2020, Frias is a visual arts fellow at the Tulsa Artist Fellowship in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and a research fellow for the Oklahoma Center for Humanities Research Seminar on Play. Their work has been exhibited throughout North and South America, with recent exhibitions at Disjecta Contemporary Art Center in Portland, Oregon, and the Vincent Price Art Museum in Los Angeles. On this episode, Edgar discusses how art can be a sanctuary, the potency of colorful magic, and how they use witchcraft to celebrate their expansive, ever-changing self. Edgar joined me from their artist residency space in Tulsa, Oklahoma, via Zoom. Edgar Fabian Frias, welcome to The Witch Wave. Thank you so much, Pam. I'm so grateful to be on this podcast. I'm so grateful to you for making the time. So there are so many reasons that I wanted to talk to you on the show today. You are a multiplicity of a human being. You do so many things in the art world and the world of magic. And of course, those are probably one and the same. So I'd love to hear how you talk about what it is that you do these days. Yeah, I've allowed myself to expand into so many different realms. I love letting people know that there is a way that we can live where we can be liminal and flow in between different fields of thought and creativity. So I definitely love blending witchcraft and magic and of connecting it to art practice too. So I'm in the healing arts. I see myself as a brujekis, as a curanderekis, or as a maracame. I'm indigenous, I'm pirarica. So the medicine people of my people are the maracame. And they're definitely someone that don't really see a distinction between art and magic and culture. So I am very much in that flow. (laughs) That's so beautiful. Now, you just used a whole bunch of gorgeous and intriguing sounding words. Would you mind defining some of the language that you just used for my listeners who might not be familiar with some of those terms? So brujekis is kind of the non-binary or gender expansive version of brujo, bruja. I identify as non-binary. So that's definitely, I love kind of adding an equi. So curandero, curandera, and curanderequi. So that's like healing person or medicine person. Also, maracame is what in the West we call shaman or medicine person of the Vidarica or the Huichol, which is an indigenous community from Mexico that I am a descendant of. Fantastic. And now you also talk about gender expansiveness. And I know this is a really, really important topic for you and one we might expand upon in more detail as our conversation unfolds. But since you brought it up, I would love to talk about the ways in which you relate to the archetype of the witch as a non-binary person. Because, look, I wrote a book that's about how the witch is primarily 
interacted with as a feminine archetype. But I certainly didn't mean that to be gender exclusive. It wasn't necessarily about how one identifies as a person, more as an archetypal energy. But I would love to know how you relate to the archetype of the witch as a gender non-binary person. Yeah, I definitely feel like witch it, as like an egregore, as a concept, as an energy is such a powerful being <laughs> in this moment. And yes. I love the archetype of the witch. It has such a powerful charge politically, socially, culturally. And, you know, I'm definitely a goddess and a goddess worshiper. And I think part of that is really honoring the sacred femme within and without. And, you know, as a non-binary person, I definitely really resonate highly with femme energy, with femme magic, and also really understand that femme is very expansive. And as you said, does not have to be connected to a body or an identity. It's really more of a flow of energy, a flow of magic. And I think part of it politically too is like honoring and upholding energies, ways of being, ways of nurturing, ways of caring, ways of producing, ways of magic that have been cast out of the system. And that to me is something that is really important in my practice and part of why I love identifying also as a witch or as I said earlier, as a brujekis too. That is gorgeous. And you are an artist. I haven't had the pleasure of being in any of your installations or exhibitions in person. But from what I see online, they really seem to be these atmospheric healing spaces that are blending together your magical practice, your multivariant identities or multivalent identities, and really play on this idea of art as a transformational vehicle. So if you could indulge my listeners, since this is an audio format, and maybe describe one or two of your more recent installations, I'd love for them to be transported there through your words. Yeah, most recently I had a solo show in Portland at this beautiful contemporary art center called Disjecta. And for that show, it was called Nierica Santuario Somatico. And Nierica is also known as the Eye of God or the Ojo de Dios. It is from my people and it is a sacred portal. It is an offering and it is an invocation to the ancestors. And so for this installation, I created multiple fabric pieces. There were pillows and shower curtains. I made multiple videos and also these beautiful prints that spoke to different archetypes that are in kind of the collective consciousness. And a part of the experience, I held an opening ceremony that I called the Etheric Bodies Ceremony. And I invited people to connect with a etheric body potion or, or an aura spray that people were able to imbue with their own intention. So we held a ceremony to imbue intention into the spray. And then after that, the spray was taken into the installation and people were able to connect with that as a part of their experience of viewing the artwork kind of working with altered states, with plant medicine, and, and as you said earlier, seeing art as a space of transformation, of transcendence, and also as a sanctuary too. Absolutely. And the ways in which I think you remind people that art is a portal and art is something that can be interacted with and that it can transform the viewer, that the viewer need not be passive but can actually participate. And in fact, the art comes more alive when we bring our participatory energy to it. I just find that really, really moving, Edgar. Thank you. I think that is something that has inspired me so profoundly is witnessing the divine intuition in other people and seeing that kind of awaken and expand is such a gift. And for myself, it's definitely why I love collaborating with people. And I love also being an educator and working with people in that capacity where you're kind of supporting someone and holding space for them. Absolutely. 
And when I was looking on your website earlier to prepare for this interview, you use so many beautiful words to describe these kind of sanctuary spaces that you build and create. Words like respite, empathy, self-reflection, and then two of my favorite words, especially in relation to art, humor and curiosity. (laughs) And I want to talk also about the look of your artwork because it is super saturated with color. You often have this reverent irreverence to your work. It's very bright. It's joyful. It is serious but doesn't take itself too seriously. And I would love to know how you have come to that voice or that style in your work. Mm, such a good question. <laughs> you know, part of it is I definitely have worked at allowing myself to play more as a, an adult and to really tap into things that bring me joy. And so a lot of the work that I make is my own self-care. And I think the kind of aesthetic really comes from multiple places. I think part of it is inspired by my own Indigenous background, the sacred psychedelic work of my people and the colors that are used. And it's definitely working with color magic and connecting to different points in the kind of energy body. And then I also feel like so many other witches, I am loving kind of recycling, transmuting, repurposing kind of aesthetics and images and archetypes, because I definitely feel like So much of this system, the colonialist patriarchal system, has really brainwashed us and used concepts and memes to really work with our consciousness. And so a lot of witches, you know, we're really kind of working with that energy and saying, okay, well, we can create our own content, our own brainwashing, you know, our own ways of like working with these schemas, with these egregores that are created. And I think I'm really a part of that legacy, a part of that movement in many ways. Absolutely. You also bring that style to your Instagram feeds, <laughs> and, and they bring me so much joy for those who haven't experienced them yet. I mean, it is a rainbow colored psychedelic grid that you have created <laughs> in both of your feeds. You also have these wonderful videos of yourself either leading us through meditations or tarot pulls that, again, are sometimes really funny. For a while, you were modifying your voice so that you kind of sounded like Alvin and the Chipmunks. (laughs) (laughs) And I wanted to ask you about that, you know, because you're giving this sacred wisdom, but it's through this, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's hilarious, delightful, I was going to say lens, even though that's a visual word. So what made you decide to do those videos? What's interesting is that at first it started off me, I'm a very expansive person in my language and I like wanted to kind of be able to cram more information into my videos so I realized if I fast forwarded my voice I can say a lot more that was one (laughs) and two I definitely feel like humor is a portal just like altered states are a portal art is a portal and there are ways that kind of humor curiosity can be really used as tools to break through some of these like maybe old ways of thinking or knowing like these calcified structures that are in consciousness and for myself art has been that huge transformational kind of space where I've been able to have some old ways of thinking or believing or feeling about myself and kind of really allowing those to transform me. So I love working with humor. I love working also with failure and allowing myself to play. And I think play is such a powerful like modality. So I definitely bring a lot of that into my work. Absolutely. Now, did you at first feel resistance to doing that? Because I know the art world can often be this very self-serious place. There's certainly so many issues of hierarchy and capitalism, and even the style of the white cube seems to take itself so seriously. So did it come naturally for you to bring this more colorful, humorous, irreverent magic to these spaces? (laughs) You know, I definitely know for a long time I did struggle a lot as an artist I struggled feeling like I had a voice or that my aesthetic or my humor was valid in those spaces and for a long time I do feel like people really didn't not to say people didn't like my work people didn't understand it or couldn't really make sense of it and I think 
something that has really helped me was when I moved to Los Angeles, this was in 2015, I met a huge group, a network of witches who are also artists and creatives and organizers and curators, et cetera, et cetera. All these divine liminal beings who really are working with authenticity, with vulnerability. And it really started to repurpose my own idea of what art means. And one of those people is Eliza Swan from the Golden Dome School. Yes, Love her so much. She's definitely created a whole culture around honoring intuition and play and joy and pleasure and failure, like all the things that I feel like in school we're told are not important, but really honoring those things and witnessing the magic that can come from that honoring. I definitely would say I still enter into contemporary art spaces where there's confusion or, you know, and I have to kind of explain my work or validate it through a certain lens, you know, but that's where I think being a liminal person, I'm able to say, okay, how do I build a bridge here to help this person access this. Fabulous. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. So I'm obviously a big fan of witchcraft as a tool for changing your life, but it is absolutely no replacement for professional therapy. I should know because I've been seeing a therapist for most of my adult life, and it has helped me so much with anxiety, trauma, the blues, and also just the day-to-day stresses that come up for all of us. That's why I'm so happy to tell you about BetterHelp. BetterHelp is making therapy more accessible for people because they offer online counseling. That's right. You can now connect to BetterHelp's professional counselors from the privacy of your own computer or phone. And so it's incredibly convenient. And you can get help at your own pace by scheduling secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and texting. BetterHelp's licensed professional counselors specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, hello, relationships, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, self-esteem. In other words, pretty much everything that human beings deal with at some point in their lives. And everything you share is 100% confidential. Also good to know is that if your counselor isn't a good fit for any reason, no problem. You can request a new one at any time for no additional charge, and you can get set up for your first session in under 24 hours. BetterHelp is making therapy more accessible and more affordable. It even has financial aid for those who qualify. And best of all, Witch Wave listeners get 10% off the first month of counseling by using offer code WITCHWAVE. That's all one word, WITCHWAVE. So if you, like me, could use a little extra help sometimes, don't hesitate. Mental well-being is so important. Please go to betterhelp.com slash witchwave, where you'll fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash witchwave for 10% off your first month. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today, I'm speaking with Edgar Fabian Frias. So Edgar, we were talking about bringing your irreverent magic and your colorful magic into these white spaces and into the art world. I know right now you are in Tulsa, Oklahoma, doing an artist's residency, and I would love to hear about your experience so far. Oh my goodness, this has been so magical. I've been here almost a year and a half now. I was living in Los Angeles before I came here, but the Tulsa Artist Fellowship has given me the opportunity for the first time in my life to fully be a practicing artist and to really just expand what that means. A lot of my work before I came here was very like social, you know, social practice or community based because I didn't have an art studio. So I wasn't really able to produce a lot. So in the last year and a half, I really started to expand production of work, working with video, working with fabrics, working with images, making objects, like all things that I wasn't able to do. And so that has completely transformed my practice. So, and and definitely being in Tulsa, you know, being in this part of the country has been 
such a learning experience. There are so many divine Indigenous folks here, like the Osage, the Muscogee Creek, and being able to connect with them and to witness some of their art, some of their culture and practices has also been so enriching for my soul. So I've definitely really appreciated having this time and space here. That's fantastic. And do you have a specific project that you've been working on or have you just been freestyle creating? Uh, So I basically, since I got here, I've had projects this whole time. So I've had in this year and a half, I've had two solo shows. The one I talked about earlier in Portland, Oregon. And then I had one last year in Los Angeles at the Vincent Price Art Museum. And in between those, I've been a part of multiple group shows. And last year I was honored to work with Sarah Faith Godestiner on the Lunar Planner. And I also was a part of the Commons, which is a talk show style show for witches by witches. And so I've done all these like small projects that are connected both to the contemporary art world as well as to the witch world. So I definitely see myself flowing in between those. But, you know, I think the one thing that is really different is before I used to do all of these projects and in between me working with people as a therapist, in between working with people as a tarot reader or as someone that holds ceremony or space for folks. But now really I'm just able to really focus on that full time here. So fantastic and so well deserved. Congratulations, Edgar. Thank you. <laughs> so you brought up your background as a therapist, and I would love to hear a little bit more about that. I was reading that you specialized in interpersonal neurobiology and somatic psychotherapy. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, so the field of interpersonal neurobiology is like an emergent field that is also very liminal and interdisciplinary. They work with different ways of knowing, but the big thing with them is that they're looking at systems and relationships and how the brain develops within relationship. And so for me, that was like a way of thinking that is really honoring indigenous wisdom and different mystical traditions. And the same with somatic psychotherapy, it's really a way of honoring you as an entire system and seeing your body as a part of your consciousness, as a part of the mind, and really working with all the different pieces together. So that's definitely something that I bring into my non-therapeutic practice a lot, just in terms of awareness, in terms of working with people. I love to think of systems as a whole when I'm working with communities or with projects. And so that can sometimes be a little bit like disorienting, but I'm someone who's pretty like multiplist. Something that really helps me is I'm a Gemini sun sign and I think (laughs) I'm able to flow and fold a lot of things at once. So that's really helpful. How fantastic. And you're not currently taking any patients now, are you? No, no. So I have my license in California and I don't have it here in Oklahoma. So, and also, you know, as I said, I've been just fully focusing on my art full time here. But, you know, when and if I do a move back to California, I'll definitely be working with folks as a therapist as well. How fabulous. We recently had Jessica Dorr on the podcast. I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but she blends together tarot and therapy. She also is a a trained social worker, and she's wonderful. And it really excites me to speak to people like yourself and people like her who see how interconnected our emotions, our bodies, and our spirits are. Because ultimately, I think that's what a lot of us who are drawn to this work are circling around. You know, how can we take the notion of consciousness and elevate it in our bodies and in our spirits and Mm -hmm. in our relationships with one another and with the planet? And so I'm very interested to hear different people's backgrounds into this work because so many of us have had to cobble it together, (laughs) you know, (laughs) because there isn't like a major right in, I don't know what you would even call it. I guess you would call it witchcraft. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that really resonates so much with me because I feel like from an early age, my ancestors were telling me that I was a medicine person, that I had a special role. And I would look around and I'd be like, I'm in capitalism. I'm in art school. Like, how does that even exist within this system? And I definitely feel like I've cobbled together into like my queer and trans and feminist communities. Like I've been able to like really hold and bring many things together together. But it's definitely been a process. And as you said, it's something that is
is not offered. And I think that's also part of what really helps me be in this field is like, I want to be there knowing that I didn't really have those folks until maybe later on in my life or when some of those angels came into my life. So I definitely want to be a part of that for other people as well. Absolutely. So I would love to hear a little bit of your origin story. Let's just start when you were young. Were you already kind of gravitating towards magical practices? How did this come into your life? I've definitely been someone that has felt very connected to spirit, connected to animals and plants, and I've communicated a lot without really having the language for it. But I did grow up in a very religious household. I was Jehovah's Witness. Wow. So witchcraft and you know magic were seen as really evil things. So it wasn't something that I practiced growing up, but I was imaginative. I was playful. So I was constantly doing witchcraft and without really thinking of it that way. But I would say it wasn't really until I was in my like early 20s that I started to meet some like radical like underground queer anarchists and meeting some like trans feminists, folks that kind of started to show me tarot and started to show me like ceremony and ritual and pretty soon I feel like it started to resonate more and more and I started to step into that but I think you know like a lot of us who are called to these roles there was definitely resistance and I'm really grateful now that I'm really standing in my purpose and in my role because I feel like my life has fully transformed but I also understand how scary it can be to move towards something especially when you live in a system that doesn't really support it or hold space for it. Absolutely. Where did you grow up, Edgar? I grew up in Southern California in a small little town called Bloomington that is about 50 miles east of Los Angeles. Okay. So were you going into LA to kind of find your kindred weirdos or did that not happen until you were a bit older? So it did start happening when I was young. And when I was 14, I was taken to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Yes. And that was the first time I had a transcendental experience. And it was in front of an art piece by this artist named Edward Keenholz. And that to me really kind of cemented this idea or this knowing that art can be used as a spell or as a portal, as a way to transmit information beyond language, beyond time and space. And I feel like ever since then, I became addicted and had to go to LA as much as I could. (laughs) But it wasn't really until I was in my undergrad, I was at UC Riverside studying art and psychology that I studied abroad in England. And I ended up meeting a bunch of radical queer anarchists that were squatting and they were like all punks. And like, they were also practicing witchcraft and were really the folks that started to kind of help me understand in many ways, like the transcestor and queer ancestor legacy that I'm a part of. So when you spoke earlier about connecting to your indigenous roots, it sounds like that wasn't necessarily something that your parents or parent figures were giving you. That's something that you kind of circled back to a little bit later in your life. Is that right? Definitely. It actually wasn't until my 30s. I have received many messages from my ancestors, but I didn't know who they were. I just was hearing, you know, voices in my head, basically. Mm. And it wasn't until my early 30s that I had a dream. It's a whole story, but basically I had a dream that there was a crystal calling me in the mountains. And I went on hikes with my partner and I found a couple of crystals. And one of those crystals sent me a message. And I was so confused by the message that I actually, at some point, ended up talking to my father about it. And my father just said offhand, oh, your grandfather used to talk to crystals, but he stopped doing that when we moved into the village. And I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? Like, Mm -hmm. you've never told me about this. After some talking with my dad, he finally opened up and said, you know, we're indigenous. I've never really spoken to you about this, but we do have other customs and ways of being. And it was that moment that I really feel like... Like everything made sense. I finally knew why I felt called to be a medicine person, why I have certain oracular gifts and realized I am a part of a community, but because of colonization, I have never really been able to connect with that until most recently. And so I've really been trying to dive deep into that now to really understand and connect with my ancestors and with living folks to be able to maybe repair and be able to gather some of what's been lost, essentially. It's so 
affirming to hear you talk about that because the longer I do this podcast, the more that arc of magic or kind of one's personal magical plot line, if you will, Mm, I'm realizing it it is so common, this idea that when we're younger, we're interested in magic, and then we don't really have a place for it or a space for it. And maybe we move away from it, or it's not as strong. And then when we're older, we come back to it and we realize, oh, wait, there's this whole legacy that I am part of part of. And Mm. there's so much knowledge that we can tap into. But I think it's an important thing to reiterate here. And you just did so beautifully that our magical development is often not a straight line. And many of us don't necessarily have these traditions that were passed along to us in an unbroken fashion. Sometimes there is a break, and then we have to build that bridge across that break. And it sounds like you're doing that so, so mindfully and masterfully. Thank you for saying that. I think that's really where imagination comes in and our ability to be visionaries. And I think part of that shaming, our imagination gets hit by that too, right? Our ability to play and to create. And I think that's definitely why I really love to connect, you know, magic and art together because I feel like they're so interwoven in that way that they are connected to some really divine child kind of parts of us that this system had to kind of placate or maybe try to contain in order to make this horrific system continue to work. Absolutely. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. I am so excited to be the first to announce a long-awaited debut from your favorite candle maker and mine, Mithras Candle. And that is Mithras Black. Mithras Black is a gorgeous new line of black beeswax candles in their signature style made with a plant-based dye. These handmade tools have an ancient and mystical past inspired by new discoveries in light science. As the company grows, Mithras Candle are balancing their natural golden beeswax with the mystery and transformative power of black candles. There are times when we are faced with an unknown. How can we process and transmute the pain of grief, the vulnerability of waiting? When we must honor moon cycles, process hard feelings, heal, surrender, or cast protection. When we are tired and hopeless, what we need is restoration of spirit. Mithras Black is for those times. Black candles have been traditionally associated with protection and absorption of negative energy. Plus, they look absolutely gorgeous. Our friends in Philadelphia are now asking for your support with a big push in crowdfunding on Indiegogo for new equipment and supplies to bring these beauties into being. There are so many juicy reward offerings, including all our favorite classic Mithras candles now in black with limited edition wearable emblems, one-of-a-kind cauldron candle vessels from ceramicist Clarissa Eck, and a custom Mithras candle photo print from witch photographer extraordinaire Courtney Brooke Hall. Visit the Mithras Candle campaign today, and all early bird contributors will receive a free pair of black votives. Go to MithrasCandle.com, that's M as in magic, I-T-H-R-A-S, Candle.com, and click on the campaign link, or you can go to their Instagram account. On behalf of Mithras Candle, thank you for your support. Wishing warmth light, and shadow to all. Hello, Witchwave listener. I am so thrilled to finally unveil the Witchwave Patreon. By becoming a Witchwave patron, you'll get to access Witchwave Plus, which has bonus episodes and ad-free full-length episodes. 
You'll also be able to join our members-only digital coven, where we'll be doing live video chats, sharing witchy news and tips, and where you can meet other Witch Wave kindred spirits. Head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave to check out all of this and many other rewards. And thank you so much in advance for choosing to support the show. I truly appreciate it, and I can't wait to make some more magic with you. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Edgar Fabian Frias. So, Edgar, we were talking about your superhero, super witch origin story. And I would love, if you're comfortable, for you to expand upon also your journey as being a non binary person and a queer witch. When did that part of your identity and your practice? become something that you were, I don't know, more public about or more comfortable with in your own life or or whatever language feels right to you. I shouldn't put words in your mouth. You know, I think it's definitely also been a journey. And I think, you know, in many ways, we're not only disconnected from our witch past, our indigenous past, we are also disconnected from our queer and trans ancestors. And that was something that for myself, it was also a journey of cobbling together, finding those small moments where I could connect with another person or read a book, you know, and growing up in a religion in a household where being queer was seen as a sin, it was definitely something I had to do in hiding. And so it's definitely something that has really made me love smuggling energy or like this energy of transmitting information through these archaic or dense systems that need to be kind of smuggled through. I would say it wasn't until later on in my life that I learned the words queer and non-binary and what they meant. And it really, really, for the first time, there was two moments of aha with learning each word of like, oh, wow, yeah, like, because I've definitely never seen myself as someone who identified as gay or even bisexual. I've seen myself as very expansive in terms of who I find uh, someone that I can fall in love with. And in the same way, I've never seen myself as a man or a woman, but I never really understood what that meant because I I didn't really have a way to see it or to know it until I really started seeing other non-binary folks and hearing the word. And it finally really resonated like, oh yeah, this is who I am. Just seeing the rise in queer, transgender, expansive violence and hatred, like it's really made me want to be more and more vocal. But I would say since I came out of the closet at 19, I have been someone who's really allied and connected and been an accomplice with other queer, trans and gender expansive folks, because I definitely know how important it is for us to have each other, you know, because most of us, even if it was in subtle ways, have been cast out of other systems. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why I think the archetype of the witch is so resonant with anybody who's felt othered and who then is able to find their quote unquote coven, right? Because it's so validating and fortifying to find your people, so to speak. Yeah, it is a lot of queer and trans like witches who have really helped me. So I, part of me also feeling like a hybrid, a liminal being is like, I am indigenous. I have a huge legacy there. And I also know I have a queer and trans legacy, you know, and I also understand that there are multiple other legacies, creative legacies, kind of natural animal legacies, different legacies that I'm holding and containing in my body. That's really, really beautiful. One of the exhibitions that you put on recently is called Perpetual Flowering, and that phrase is so moving to me and really, I think, speaks to what we all hopefully do as human beings, but certainly what you've given yourself the permission to do in terms of all of these different ways of being that you've incorporated and expressed in your life. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely been a journey too. I've gone from feeling like I had to choose a career, I had to choose one way of living and felt so trapped in that reality. And it's definitely been a journey to say, okay, I can expand beyond that and move towards the energy, move towards what feels exciting. And that's just really transformed my way of living. And so it's something that I love also preaching and helping other people know that it is a possibility and that we're co-creating that even more together. 
gorgeous. I want to shift a little bit and talk about your tarot practice, your practice of Reiki and ceremony and all of these other what I'll call healing modalities or magical modalities that you offer to the community or to individuals one-on-one. And you've been doing these workshops and these online videos of leading people through spells and meditations and various rituals. And you had one recently called the Waxing Moon COVID-19 Healing Spell. And I would love for you to, first of all, describe how that went. I know it was a a few weeks ago and what your intention was for that. But also, if you could touch on any messages or even bits of advice that you might want to offer our listeners today regarding how they can find footing in this very tumultuous time that we're in. Yeah, because I've definitely had like a a ceremonial and a tarot practice for a long time. I've also had like, as you said earlier, like an Instagram presence and a way that I've engaged with people a lot. But, you know, because of the situation, this pandemic that we're in, I've been moving more towards online platforms and hosting online ceremony. And the COVID-19 waxing gibbous moon spell, that one was done in collaboration with a friend of mine named Amalia Canua. She's the first person that actually read me tarot. She's a queer Latinx bruja that lives in Portland. And her name is Lady Santa Puta on Instagram. She came down with COVID-19 and was diagnosed and had a very difficult time getting tested and also was really kind of concerned that like people in her community were not getting tested especially even people that she had had contact with but you know one thing that really happened was that it really for her helped her step more into her power as a witch and really kind of claim her health claim her uh, protection around her family and so one thing that's really come forward in the work that we've been doing is the power that we have within and the power that we have as a community to continue to hold one another through this crisis to continue to reach out and to also mutate along you know with the way that we're all mutating is finding ways to rethink what a coven means or what ceremony looks like. And, you know, I've never hosted online ceremony, but it's definitely something that I'm really witnessing people are needing and I'm needing it too. And I think that's also part of what it's been inspiring is seeing so many witches, mystics and artists offering so generously. And I actually have a ceremony coming up on April 26th that I'm offering donation based. That's going to be working with the waxing crescent moon and blending both divination practices and artistic kind of creation in many ways trying to find ways to really support with art with divination with magic and really tapping into that power within because we really need that right now to just protect and stay strong and to be there for each other absolutely and i feel compelled to add the disclaimer that of course we need vaccines and testing and hand washing. I don't think either of us are implying that magic will cure us of this virus. Of course not. No, this is really to support the spirit because yes, we can have vaccines and things to cure the virus medicinally, but you know, what's happening is also existential right now. It's also really hitting us to the core of what it means to be human, what it means to be a species. Like this is way beyond a virus. So I think we're needing narratives, stories, we're needing ways to interpret and to tap into our intuition right now. And those all go beyond medicine. Absolutely. And also, as you're saying, ways to connect with each other because this is such an isolating time that I think these online rituals are really, really helping people feel more interconnected and less alone, which frankly can help the body feel stronger too, because stress can really affect our immune systems. Definitely. So Edgar, I could see someone look at your work and see all of the rainbows and the colors and the cheer and the joy and perhaps think that 
you don't engage with shadow or pain or darkness. Now, I don't think that to be true, but I would love to know how do you integrate shadow into your work and acknowledging grief and pain and things that we're going through, not just in this moment, but that all humans go through at times? I definitely have had that come up before. And I think, you know, For me, my art practice is a sanctuary of transmutation. A lot of the joyous, colorful imagery comes from pain, comes from anger, comes from fear. And I think lots of times, you know, when I bring those emotions and when I bring that shadow energy into my practice, I really work to transmute it. And that's really part of what creates this very colorful, very joyous, very empowering kind of practice. And I definitely would say as a witch, as a psychotherapist, as someone that works with people, I'm very, very well accustomed to working with the shadow. And I can see, you know, both the need to honor the shadow and the need to bring it into our world, into our practice. And I don't have a calling to work with shadow in an aesthetic way or to kind of show shadow in that way. I think more of it, I feel called to work with shadow, to do work with it as like a healer, as an energy worker. And so people, you know, constantly message me and tell me like, I was in a really dark place and I saw one of your posts and it pulled me out. And I definitely feel like that is what it's doing for me when I'm working and creating those spells. And so I'm really grateful that it's like really kind of translating and really supporting other people. But I definitely have had people say like, you're only showing the happy side or like the empowering side. And it's like, yes, but that like comes through my own personal work to get to that point. Exactly. I think that often love and compassion and beauty and color are trivialized when in fact the work that it takes to be able to make space for that and then give it back to others is often quite intense. It's often the result of going through one's own pain. It's the hero's journey, right? You go into the underworld and then come back out and deliver that medicine, that magic, those gifts back into your community. And that's definitely what I glean from your work. It doesn't seem like a light touch at all. It seems like thick, deep, vivid, serious, joyful, playful magic. And I definitely feel like with that multiplicity, the mo- holding the multiplicities, I think it's possible to hold them all together. And I think that is part of the power of integration, the power of magic, the power of ceremony. It's a, it's a place where you open up these kind of regimentations and then you hold space for them to start to flow and come together. And I definitely feel, as you said, there's also a way that we can work with beauty and magic and joy and pleasure and play to really kind of also work that serious magic. So I think for me as a therapist, one of the things I've learned is that sometimes where you're in that feeling of play with another client, you're doing some deep work, you know, and that's something that our system that values work and seriousness so much does not really understand. It's so true because it's also about allowing us to let go of our inhibitions, right? (laughs) Definitely. And to tap into another part of us that is able to be and to expand beyond the limiting feelings and beliefs that we've kind of been made to believe. (sighs) Well, Edgar, I feel like I have expanded since the beginning of our conversation today. I'm so grateful to you. Before we go, can you please share with our listeners how they can tap into more of your prismatic magic online? My main website is edgarfabianfrias.org. So there I upload kind of workshops and things that I do. I'm also on Instagram under at edgarfabianfrias altogether. I also have my healing and tarot practice called Our Sacred Web. O-U-R underscore sacred underscore web. I mean, both of those are on Instagram. So, and I do have a mailing list as well. And you can find that if you go to either my website or my Instagram. Fabulous. And I saw that you have a few different workshops and rituals coming up that people might be able to participate in online as well. So I highly encourage people to do so. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Pam. It's been such an honor to connect with you and to be on this incredible podcast and to really connect with your community. It's such an honor. So thank you so much for inviting me. 
Edgar, thank you. Thank you for your witchcraft and your bright, expansive spirit. You have made my day better just in speaking with you, and I can't wait to share your words with more people. Thank you for being on the Witch Wave. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Edgar, Phoebe, and Frias for their bright magic and bold beauty. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on the Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is produced, written, and recorded by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was edited by Rachel Jacobs, thank you Rachel, and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Lara Antal, and Chiquita Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now buy Witch Wave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and give us lots of sparkly stars. It really does make a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchWavePod. And you can check out my Witch Emoji for iPhone by going to WitchEmoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want even more Witch Wave, or you would just like to support the show, please join us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave. <laughs>